Hi, I'm Dr. Angela Yakey. And I'm Dr. Kathleen O'Neill Smith. Welcome back to the Fire em Up Doctors Good Medicine docuseries. We are so glad you joined us. We want to provide you with credible health resources, guide you in your treatment options, and fire you up to take control of your health. Hi, it's Dr. Angela Yakey. And Dr. Kathleen O'Neill Smith. And we're the Fire em Up Doctors. It's March 26, 2020. And we're doing an update on our thoughts, a day in the life of the Fire em Up Doctors regarding the coronavirus COVID-19. How was your week? Well, so here we are at home. I'm in Boston. You're in Gainesville. I'm in my home office. Yeah, I'm in my home. And so we're basically doing lots of telemedicine, right? because we know that the transmission of this virus is from person to person. And if we self-isolate and self-quarantine, we don't put our patients at risk and we're not at risk. We don't put our families at risk. So I think in, the week was very, very busy. People are very concerned and there's a lot of information out there. One thing I think is that what has been found is that the, this COVID-19 is infecting clusters of family members. And so identifying and stopping these discrete outbreaks is going to be the key thing, right? Or groups of people who congregate together. So I think that that's one of the things that's really important for us to identify and help people understand. How has your week been? Yeah, so as you know, I actually spend my mornings in a hazmat suit in my parking lot doing drive-up evaluations. And I've been coaching doctors all over the country on how to do this because I have a primary care practice as well. And this morning, I was awakened at 6 a.m. with my first two positive COVID swabs. And, and I just want to speak to specifically one family because it illustrates what you said about social distancing. So the first young lady was a 32-year-old lady who had come from Delhi, India, through Turkey, through wow. London, through all the way to um, D.C., into Orlando MCO Airport around March 13th. She was astonished that in Turkey, the, on March 13th, they were actually checking her temperature, swabbing her hands for something, and making sure she didn't have symptoms. But there was no, no precautions when she hit Orlando. But she knew her mother had chronic lung disease in her 60s, so she knew to self-isolate. So between the 13th and the 17th, she was totally asymptomatic but they're very blessed to have a huge farm with three different separate houses, like a compound. So she stayed in one of the houses thinking she might be sick. So four days later, she's developed a sore throat, severe muscle aches, fever to 100, 99 to 100. So I got called to see her as a new patient on the 18th and swabbed her. And it took, uh, took eight days to get the swab back, but it was positive today. So I spent my morning speaking with her family. So I had swabbed her mother, with chronic lung disease who had a little cold but lived in another house that thankfully came back negative Fantastic. her father's is pending but this young woman's at 32 is positive so she's in isolation and her entire compound is in their separate isolation houses on her compound and i think that's the key that is the key so what will you do for her presently so right now i'm managing her with uh our custom designed uh med packs immune packs which actually has vitamin D, zinc, and immunoglobulin. And then I put her on three grams of vitamin C per day, as well as proline-rich plasma. So, um, so, but she's actually, she started turning, she started getting better on her own about two days ago. So she says she feels about 90% better, but it got a little rough about four or five days ago. She got some shortness of breath. She got the chest pain, but her immune system's young. She doesn't have any other medical problems. But the key thing for her is to not get her mother sick because her mother has chronic lung disease in her 60s with right. lung nodules. So, so staying away from her is key because otherwise she could end up needing a respirator, correct? Yes, she's a high risk type, over 65 with chronic lung disease. She's the type if she got COVID-19, she would get really sick needing a respirator. So we are concerned about that group, but I do want to note that um, within hospital settings, according to my, the information, the sources that I'm reading, more than 50% are between the ages of 20 and 50. 
So they may not be the ones needing respirators. Some of them are, but certainly the hospitalized patient, from what I understand, more than 50% are between the ages of 20 and 50. And it may be like a patient like yours who fortunately got better on their own, it doesn't get better on their own, may need to go in for fluids or whatever other treatments they're offering and monitoring so that they can, you know, obviously be treated appropriately if necessary. Yeah, um, I was a little more concerned about my second case, so if that was positive today. So she, I, make, I just want to make a correction to something. You said proline-rich plasma. It's actually proline-rich peptides that we're using oh, sorry. as Thank opposed you. to plasma. We're not using plasma presently, but plasmapheresis is on the is is on the horizon. Okay. So proline-rich peptide. Thank you yeah. for correcting that. So I was a little concerned, more concerned about my second positive COVID case. Do you want to hear about her? Yes. So she's a 55-year-old woman who was visiting her son for a ski trip um, two weeks ago in, in Vail, Colorado. And in that county called Eagle County, um, in mid-March, there were 10 reported cases, though she didn't know of anybody in her resort. So she came home about 10 days ago and on the plane started feeling ill. The plane was not packed, though. With um, her, she presented with a very sore throat, fatigue, and she spiked a temp to 102. And then, so I saw her again about eight days ago, and she was more concerned because she's got a chronic disease. She's got Crohn's disease. But thankfully, we've managed her well on her Crohn's disease, so she's not on any immunosuppressants. So when I saw her today via telehealth, she actually said that for the first time yesterday, she was able to get out of bed. She didn't get terribly winded or short of breath. But I do want to comment that the three things that I need to manage someone who has the disease that would help be really helpful are, uh, number one, a, a thermometer, reliable thermometer. Absolutely. Number, number two, a pulse oximeter, so I can monitor their breathing, their oxygenation. And, you know, that is a really good $22 investment. I think you can get them as low as that because you want to stay above 90% for sure. And if you see it normal, 99, 100, and you see it trending down as I'm monitoring you every day, that's concerning. And really that with a fever. So it's not like sometimes these devices are not accurate. We just want to, so a fever, other symptoms, I think shortness of breath in addition to just the number, right? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then a blood pressure cuff because um, I actually think I've been seeing the, the GI presentation, the gastroenterological presentation of COVID-19. I'll be swabbing someone tomorrow who I think is a gastroenterological presentation, which is a, um, according to the Wuhan study of, nine, of almost 2,000 patients, uh, vomiting presents 5% of the time and diarrhea 4% of the time. And I actually think the young lady who's in her mid-30s, I was on telehealth with today, who's been vomiting, I think she has it. So she's coming through the drive-up evaluation tomorrow to have a swab. So my a blood pressure, is she's dizzy, and she stands vomiting, up. My understanding is that vomiting is not a terrible thing. My understanding is that vomiting is helping you get rid of the, the um, virus. You know, the, you're getting GI symptoms because there are receptors in the GI tract for the way that this virus will infect. And for those whose receptors are being activated, that this could be a positive thing. So that's not a reason to run to an emergency room right away, unless you're dehydrated, shortness of breath, you know, et cetera, right? Fever. Yeah, and I'd say I'm managing her at home with hydration. And I told her the story of, you know, cause she did have, basically you'll get into trouble with electrolyte imbalance and volume depletion. So as long as she's got good electrolyte balance. She's got a boyfriend who's starting to get sick, who's manage, helping to manage her. So I had recommended the tri salts, uh, coconut water. I don't like Gatorade because of the sugar, even though I'm a UF Gator. But in these situations, I think you should stay hydrated, help whatever it takes. Pedialyte. Pedialyte's probably the best in my book, I think, because um, it's tried and true in the pediatric population. But I think also coconut water can be very sugary too. Yeah. So that's what's going on in my practice. A lot of activity. I've been, I saw 47 drive up evaluations last week and this week on, to, my, not even counting tomorrow, I'm already at about 25. So, uh, so I got 13 more swaps. So here's a couple questions. One is, um, 
I think it's really important for us to let people know that it's the constellation of symptoms. You do, we do not want people running to an emergency room. In Boston, you can't do that. You will not be seen in an emergency room for a test unless you go through their phone system that basically helps you determine if you're at risk. And they will monitor you at home and check in on you through this telemedicine system before they have you come into the ER. Because we see the lines, I mean, lines and lines and lines and lines of people in New York waiting to get into an ER. And that's just not gonna help anybody because they're all now not socially distancing, right? And we don't know who's gonna get sick in that line. So the, if you have a fever, monitor the fever. If you have a sore throat, that's okay. If you have nausea, vomiting, stay hydrated, do your best. Apparently with movement and other things is when this gets activated for the nausea and vomiting, as opposed to if you're lying still in bed. But you should be moving, you should be activating, and you wanna get this, this whole system to, to uh, proceed through your body and to get the immunity to it. So I think that it's really important to, for people to know when to see somebody and when to call. If you're afraid, definitely call. There are lots of you know, lines open to help people understand what to do. If you have a PCP who has a hazmat suit, you can go there, and if they have testing, they can do the testing, the acute swab testing. It may take days, so you'll self-quarantine no matter what for that to come back. Um, and fever and shortness of breath and sore throat and vomiting would be the indicators for being seen, whether through a video conference or ideally not in person. Because even though you have a hazmat suit on, they're limited, and also um, you're still at risk. Yeah, yeah. So what I do is I triage them from the picnic bench about 100 yards away. And then if I think it could be something else like um, pneumonia or strep or something, because we are in flu season, then I'll actually go test them. But I'm not intentionally trying to be within distance of people, but I just want to make sure things that are treatable are being seen. I will tell you that there was a, an older patient of mine who refused to go to the emergency room even though she had, so it's a seven, about a 70 year old woman who had fever to 102, was short of breath, couldn't walk around to go to the bathroom. And I called her just to, so she'd go to the ER and she absolutely refused. So I did the best I could with telehealth. And in the end, I decided she might have pneumonia by listening to her kind of gurgling. And I knew that the sputum production with COVID is only one third. She sounded gurgly, she looked bad. So I, I kind of did the best I could and gave her Levaquin. And within 24 hours, her temp went down to normal. So it went from 102 to normal within 24, 36 hours, and her shortness of breath is better. Her daughter brought a, a, an oximeter. It's 97%. So even just like, I probably, if she came up as a drive-up evaluation, would have listened to her lungs. But even just telehealth, I was able to ascertain with her that it was probably pneumonia because Levaquin wouldn't treat COVID. So she's right. getting better. That was a save right there. She's really happy. So I agree. Well, a save for the system. I mean, most importantly, a save for the system. Pneumonia is important, but we don't see, you know, hundreds of cases per day inundating a system with pneumonia, right? I mean, that's the difference. The whole difference between the problem with COVID versus a pneumonia is the number of cases the day. It's the rate at which the cases are becoming uh, virulent and important in terms of needing hospitalization. So that's the problem, right? Because I think that they will better determine who gets, who needs the testing. And for my buddies like you, I don't want a test not to be available to find out A, if you're gonna be sick, B, if you're gonna infect others in your family, in your, in your uh, patient practice, et cetera. So I think there really needs to be a centralization to this and someone needs to be calling the shots so that we do this appropriately. Otherwise, I think we're gonna be in this situation for a very long time. So to summarize this week's Today in the Life of the Fire of Doctors, we're, we're emphasizing, emphasizing control of this epidemic through social distancing. Uh, we know that over half a million confirmed cases in the world are going on right now. And we wanna make sure that we contain, do our part at asking our patients to contain it, their part, just act as if you have it, right, is a, is a message. We went through ways to prevent it through integrative measures such as making sure you're sleeping really well. Zinc, we talked about zinc, vitamin C, melatonin, and, and did we talk about vitamin D? Vitamin D is really important too. 
vitamins, vitamin uh, women, zinc is about 30 to 60 milligrams per day. Right. And then vitamin D as well. So we went through integrative therapies. We talked about the difference between what you have available in Boston versus Gainesville. And we talked about something very important, the retrospective study out of Wuhan, China, that said that the median shedding, viral shedding, um, after you have an infection, the median was 20 days, but it could be as long as 37 days. So really just acting as if you have it and everybody else at this point, right? Yeah, we don't know who has it. It's, it's a ping pong ball that's bouncing around that we can't see. So that'll do it for now from the Fire em Up Doctors. Be safe. Be well, and God bless you. I'm going to stop the recording. Good job. We're so glad you joined us today. We hope we've given you the tools to take control of your health. For more good medicine and information about any treatments, supplements, and resources discussed today, please visit us at www.fireemupdoctors.com. That's F I R R I M up doctors.com and wherever you're listening from remember to like us on facebook and subscribe to our youtube and podcast channels so you don't miss out the information provided is not a substitute for professional medical advice this should not be used to diagnose treat or manage health problems without consultation if you do experience any of the symptoms discussed today please contact your nearest healthcare professional